Hey, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you guys are. Thanks for joining us, and I'm sorry about the delays. What can I say? Life got in the way. That happens sometimes. But here we are, and we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is composition. Let me start right here and just lay down a couple of things. So I love it when you guys leave your questions and tell us where you're from, so please do that. And this is going to be a really interesting show. Everybody needs to know more about composition, including myself. I learn stuff and I've seen these interviews that we're going to go over and I've, I've written a book about it, but I keep learning stuff. So there's a lot to know about composition. Now, let's start here at the beginning. And for those of you who don't know me, I am Mark Silber, and I am your host, photographer and author here in Carmel, California. And our show is brought to you by our friends at Bay Photo. Now, this is their special page. I want to talk about some of this stuff. This exposure is really cool. It's what my background looks like, you know, behind me. I'll show you in a second. But these are really cool. They, they are framed, and they actually float off the wall. I love that look. You have no frame around it, but you can see that it's it's held in place. Those are 30% off. I would recommend take your best photograph, turn it into one of these. You're also going to get 30% off on books and albums. How many times have we talked about creating books? Take advantage. It expires today. Guys, there's your code right there. Make a book, okay? <laughs> Super important and you're going to get 25% off on your first order. Okay. Now, composition has come up in our recent survey as the number one area of concern, struggle. And a lot of you guys mentioned things like not knowing how to break out of, you know, most photographers, I think, have four or five compositional techniques, and they get stuck in them. Sadly, a lot of people have maybe two. You know, the camera's held this way or it's held that way. Portrait or landscape? Come on. Well, I researched this a couple of years ago because I saw that it was a problem, and I ended up writing this book. And it has 83 compositional techniques in it. And I wrote it kind of like the idea was a recipe book, a cookbook. You know, if you just say to somebody, hey, Cooking, you do by feel. You know, you don't really, there's no rules to it or laws or examples even. But you just kind of figure it all out. I, I don't think that would work if you're trying to make a souffle, right? There's a lot of special steps that go into making a souffle. And if you don't do it right, it falls flat and it's a big mess. But even taking in, in, ingredients like um, bisquick, which is made up of flour, baking soda, baking powder, whatever else is in there. But with that one ingredient, you can turn it into different forms of, of food. You can turn it into pancakes. You can turn it into a cake. You can turn it into muffins. You know, there's probably 50 things you could do with that one set of ingredients. And composition works the same way. These tools work together. So here's what we're going to do. Over the years, you guys know I've done thousands and thousands of hours of interviews with some amazing photographers. Some of these you may have heard. I, I selected out little bits about specifically about composition. We're going to listen to them together, and then I'll jump in. We'll have a little discussion, and we'll go on to the next one, okay? I would recommend, if you have a notepad, take some notes here, because these are important points, and we're going to... We're going to want to really make sure we're using them. First up is our friend Chase Jarvis. Chase, you may not know the history, but he was the third person that I interviewed. I actually kicked my show off when it was originally sponsored by SanDisk with Chase. And he opened a lot of doors for me. I really appreciate it, including our next guest tomorrow, Vincent LaFerre, amazing photographer. Chase introduced me to him. So let's hear how Chase approaches composition. First thing is I look at the scene without the camera. I walk around without the camera pressed to my face because when you put the camera to your face you see a lot less than you do just walking around. So um, I'm gonna walk the area that I'm gonna shoot without the camera to my face and, and look for interesting things. 
uh, when I find things I'm going to shoot or uh, you know, I can build a scene in my mind, then I'll start putting the pieces together. And, and that's kind of a visualization for me. So uh, when I'm visualizing, I know exactly how I want this thing to look. I know I want this edge of the frame to be you know, next to this tree, and I want my subject running or jumping into this part of the frame. Um, and and I, I even actually pre-visualize all the way to, to what this could look like in post-production. Sometimes the, the simple moments are starts, and this is really important, I recommend this, don't even look around with a camera stuck to your face. Why? Because you're already limiting your view. You want a wide view. You want to be able to look at your whole area that you're photographing, whatever that scene is, and look at it with fresh eyes and walk around. You noticed you saw him walking around and checking different angles and so forth. So that's really a key point in composition. The camera comes after you visualize the photograph. That's the, that's the tool you use. You have it in your mind's eye, which is what visualization is. Then you use your camera. So he says he builds the story. He builds the scene. He gets the idea of what he wants. Like he was photographing those people running. So he has that idea. Well, if they're going to run by here. I'm going to... Right at this spot is where I want to compose the frame. They're coming right into the frame. And that's getting that decisive moment, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. But these are really important points. Don't disregard how important it is to use your own eyes and your own feet in setting up your composition. Okay, so let's jump into our next guest here. I've got to just rewind this a little bit here. Sorry, these were tightly edited. Okay, this is our friend Chris Burkhart. Sometimes the, the simple moments are the best, you know, whether, you know, whether you're out camping somewhere and, you know, you're shooting just somebody like reading by their headlamp at the middle of the night or, you know, like kind of like a pullback scenic of, you know, where you parked your van to hide out for the evening while you're, you know, waiting for the surf in the morning, something like that, you know, or whether it's just like late afternoon, you know, evening light kind of beaming down through like some fields, you know, and you're just sitting there watching the waves. I mean any simple little thing that's going to kind of spark an interest or spark a meaning in someone. I think that's kind of what I aim for because where do you point your, where do you point your camera? That's what it is. I like have some magical moment that flies out of nowhere. I mean, these are simple things he's talking about that could be around us at any time, anywhere. So don't disregard that, you know. The, he's, he's talking about each one of these quotes has got a lot of stuff, a lot of meat packed in there. So he's talking about the late afternoon sun. Well, we know about the golden hours, and you saw those incredible, the incredible light coming through. But look for the, your own simple moments that inspire you. And, that, you know, that's the other thing. We've got to be inspired. Well, that inspiration is all around us. You heard me talking about that when I was at the Golden Gate Bridge. It is all around us constantly. So it's just a matter of looking for it and finding it. Okay, now we're going to hear from our friend Bob Holmes. Let's see what... ...getting close to subjects so that you feel part of the scene. And then the, the composition, I do almost intuitively. I'm always scanning the edges of the frame mm -hmm. automatically because we're responsible for everything in that frame. You know, as a photography, it's your fault if there's something in there that shouldn't be. Right. You know, if there's a, the antenna coming out of someone's head or whatever, it's your fault. You should have seen that. Be fully involved with your subject. Right. To take your very best photographs, you have to be on your own. Yes. And you have to give the subject 100% of your concentration. You have to be there. Right. And aware of everything. And that includes when you're looking through the camera, even before you look through the camera, be aware of everything that's going on in that image that you're hoping to capture. Interesting is these guys are building on each other. So here's Bob again saying what Chase said, which is even before you pick up the camera, you want to you want to visualize what is going on. You need to look around 
and see what's going to interfere with the frame. You're responsible for everything in the frame. Pretty powerful point, you know, and don't rely on Photoshop or Lightroom to remove these things. I mean, yes, sometimes we have to do that. I do it. Look, if I have a power line I can't get rid of, yeah, I'll get rid of it in Lightroom or Photoshop. But really, my best recommendation is do all your composing in your camera. and Don't rely on cropping it later. But the other point he mentioned, which is really, um, he's brought this up before, which is he likes to use a wide angle lens, like a 28 millimeter lens, but then step in close to his subject to get that intimate feeling. And that's how you get it. So don't think that you could do the same thing with, with a 200 millimeter lens standing, you know, a hundred yards away and get the same feeling because you're not interacting with that person. This is a really key point in photography. Photography <laughs> is about people or subjects that you're capturing, but it's your interaction with them. Even a landscape, it's how you saw it and how you felt. But you're involved in it, and the more you're involved in it, the more you have your thumbprint on it, as Matthew Jordan Smith said, the more it's about you and it's a unique photograph. It's a unique creation, which is really what I would strive for. Okay, who's up next? We've got Bob. Now we're going we're gonna to hear from Chris again. Okay, so here's our friend Chris Burkhardt once again. When you stop and think about what's going to be the most significant thing, um, a lot of times it's not necessarily what you're seeing, but it's what someone else might be seeing. And so if you kind of take a step behind them, that's a good way to try and survey things too. It's not just what you're seeing, but what your subject is seeing. And take a step behind them to survey what are they looking at. Again, boy, you guys, this is, this is hard won, powerful advice that you can go right out and use. So we tend to think of taking pictures of people where they're standing right in front of the camera. Okay, that's normal for a portraiture. But there's another type of portrait, and it's called an environmental portrait. An environmental portrait is where you're taking a photograph of somebody in their environment, Bob Holmes had a few of those. You saw the guy in the butcher shop, you know, whatever. And Chris here, the surfer, this is an environmental portrait. This is that person in their environment you're capturing. But you're trying to, what Chris is saying is, try to take a look at and capture what they're seeing. Powerful stuff. Okay, who we got next is, okay, we're going to hear from Bob again. Here he is. Photographs often need a punctuation point. Tell me and, about that in that in that. And in this, the, the this young boy practicing is the punctuation. Right. And it's not it's I guess you could call it a decisive moment. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's a moment when the his attitude was good. You could read him as a ballet dancer. It's obvious that he's he's practicing a, a ballet stance. Right. Uh, and those kinds of details are absolutely critical. I shot this, I, I rarely take a single frame. I shot several frames of this, and this is the one that I like the best because of his attitude. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, it's punctuation, but it also has to be the right gesture. And this combines both. I don't know who that is we're going to hear from next. But anyway, punctuation. Bob is the master of punctuation, and it really, really makes his images pop. Now, I don't know about you, I actually, after interviewing Bob 10 years ago, I did an about face in my photographs. So one, for instance, one of the things I used to do was take landscapes and wait for everybody to clear out of the frame before I press the shutter. Now I don't do that. I leave someone in the frame to be my punctuation point. And you know what? It does a lot of things. One, it gives scale to your subject, to the bigger subject. So for instance, some of my photographs in Switzerland, they're big mountains. These are like the Eiger and the Matterhorn. They're big mountains. And you often can't realize how big they are unless you compare them to a known commodity, which is a person. So when you see the person is this tiny little figure in there who is the punctuation point, it not only adds punctuation, 
but it also gives scale and it gives the whole thing a grounding. Now, another factor, you know what? As people, we are more interested in people than stuff. I, I'm just making a big generality here and I believe it's true. Okay, you may argue with me, Mark, no, that's not true. Ansel Adams made all these photographs. None of them had any people in them at all. Yeah, that's true. He could get away with it. But they were remarkable and he put himself into it. But he did take some amazing photographs of people. Some of my favorite photographs of his are uh, portraits. And, uh, you know, I, I, yes, I do love his landscapes. But for me, I kind of have moved away from just a pure landscape in, into making sure I've got something or someone in there being a punctuation point. Now, Bob does mention... And by the way, I did put every one of these things is mentioned in one of my 83 compositional techniques. So you don't have to remember all these things. And I made it small enough to carry around in your camera bag. So you literally you could be out on a shoot, pull it out and get inspired. But Bob makes the point that it isn't always a person that's the punctuation point. It could be, he gives the example of a pole, like these two blue uh, stanchions or poles that he had in Cuba. It could be something hanging down that could be a punctuation point. But the point is exactly what he said earlier, which is you're responsible for everything in the frame. You use those elements. If you don't like the way they're lining up, move around. Use your feet. Your best friends are your feet. This is, you know, one of the drawbacks to a zoom lens is it, it's a lazy way of kind of moving around. When you should be moving around, you're just zooming in and out. And, yeah, I do that. Okay, I'm guilty of that too. But really, my earliest work was done with a single lens. Always. Either, you know, with the my Roloflex or this Leica here. Uh, those were the two cameras I shot with the most. And I walked around with a single lens. I never carried a second lens with me. That's all I had. So anytime I had to compose differently, I had to move. And there's a lot to be said for that. The famous photographer, he's a war documentary photographer, Robert Kappa, said, if your photographs are not good enough, you are not close enough. That has a double meaning because at the time he wrote that, he was a war photographer and he possibly meant you're not close enough to the action. But I really don't think that's the real meaning. It, it, yes, you should be close to the action, but the action could be whatever it is you're pointing your camera at. So Keep your feet as your best friends. Now, we're going to hear from this guy. I don't know who he is, and I'm not even sure why I included him in here, but let's see what he has to say. Here he is. Cartier-Bresson, who was one of my mentors as a photographer, basically coined a phrase called just the decisive moment. Uh, he's one of the most prolific photographers from the last century. And he is all about capturing that exact moment when something is occurring. You could say, well, does he visualize even that? Because these things have to happen in a split second. The answer is yes. There's a, there still has to be a moment of where you put yourself. Where do you point your camera? And anticipate the action so that you're, you're capturing it at that right exact moment. That's still a visualization process. I f it was fun. That was an NPR radio show I did after releasing, um, I think it was releasing this book. Uh, actually, it might have been my first book. Uh, it was kind of thrilling to be on NPR, actually. You know, it's interesting, too. You're on radio talking about a very visual subject. So I had to, you know, include a lot more detail in there. But this moment, uh, capturing the moment is a big deal. And it kind of incorporates a lot of these points we've already gone over, capturing that decisive moment. Well, Chris Burkhart said, you know, find those, find those simple moments, okay? Chase talked about, you know, again, these guys are building on each other. He was talking more about creating a moment, you know, because what example he gave was in advertising. So he's using it as an advertising photograph, but he still had to build that. And Bob is talking about, making sure you're looking at everything in the frame and then capture that exact moment. This is really important. It's a drill too, guys. You have to be fast. Now, Cartier-Bresson 
he if you don't know his work i really really recommend that you buy one of his books or look him up online but really you gotta you gotta own his book because again an online version it's watered down compared to the feel the visceral feel you get when you pick up a book and you can stare at it you can look at the photograph and it jumps back at you that's what his photographs do to me they just pull me into the scene and he was the master at finding those moments so that's a key tool always look for that moment something is happening where you know you could press the shutter a little bit before a little bit after my picture of the kids jumping you know i had to capture at that exact moment or a whole, the whole thing would have fallen apart and that comes from just training your eye and being fast with your shutter okay now we're going to hear from chase again talking about the thing kind of that gensai qua that little added ingredient size about it a little bit what could I put in here to make this the absolute best picture more often than not it means means simplifying the frame and, and I fantasize about making the, the, the best picture and then uh, the last which is I think kind of uh, marquee of my work is trying to do something that is unusual how can I put a little twist on it or as we say when we're on set how can we turn this one on its head and uh, I look for ways to make it different and uh, th those are the little things that separate it from making it an interesting photograph to a great photograph. Well, how can you turn a photograph on his head? That's a good question. And that's, you know, something you could look for. Like, what could I do? So I've got this image. I've maybe taken this photograph too many times already. Okay, the sun is going down over the water. Dude. I mean, how many sunset photographs can I take? What can I do to turn it on his head? What can I do to change it up? This is especially true when you're photographing iconic places. The Eiffel Tower, for instance. Well, I don't know if you've seen my image of the Eiffel Tower, one of the, one of the ones that I use in my book. It's a black and white photo looking up at an angle, and you don't even really see the whole tower. You just see a part of it. To me, that was my way of turning it on its head rather than taking the normal postcard image. Now, one way you can determine how not to make a cliche photograph like that is look at what's in the postcards, literally. I mean, you can see, okay, well, everybody goes to Yosemite and takes this picture of Half Dome this way. Well, find something different. In my case, I did find, uh, it was we were there during the forest fire season a couple of years ago, which is unfortunate, but it turned the sky dark and it made the uh, light on Half Dome really kind of an orangey light, which was very unusual. And that certainly was unique for that time and for Half Dome. It doesn't, thank goodness, it doesn't normally look like that. But he did talk about you fantasize, like, what could you do? What could I do to really make this image pop? And he did say something really important, which is normally that means simplifying. Less is more almost all the time. Especially, you know, again, if you have something in your frame that doesn't belong there, get it out of there. Clean it up. Clean up your frame. Move or move the, don't hesitate to get in there and move something that doesn't belong there. You're taking a picture of a person on a piano and there's a, there's a whole clutter of stuff on the piano. Well, why don't you clean it up first? There's nothing wrong with that. It's been done by the best. Okay, now I think we've got one or two more here. We're going to hear from, uh, oh yeah, next up is Chris Burkhart. And Chris is going to tell us some interesting stuff about framing and leading lines. Let's hear what he says. For just things that kind of stack up and lead your eye away, whether it's a, whether it's a straight line or whether it's you know, the angle of the beach or something like that, framing is key. Whether it's a branch or, you know, you can take the most average mundane shot of just a, a beach with, you know, maybe a simple backdrop and you, you know, kind of put a branch in there. You, you kind of peek through a tree or out a doorway or a window and you just add an instant frame that kind of, you know, offsets your photo and makes that much more unique. But First thing I ever learned about photography taught to me by my uncle Sambo, who was a photographer, was framing. And, you know, here's Chris talking about it. It's one of those basic things. Do not overlook it. There's a lot of ways to frame something. 
And, you know, he says, poke through, you know, look through a tree, see branches. And that always builds interest. There's something about it. You know, we're looking through something. It's unique. And it gives us a unique view. The other thing is leading lines are really powerful. Things that lead your eye to where you want the subject to go. In that case, he had examples of the logs on the beach. You know, diagonal, diagonal lines are also very powerful. They show motion, movement. It's a dynamic thing. Level lines are very passive. So if you want to give it a dynamic feel, you can look for something that's a leading line that angles off like that. Always look for the frames. There's so many ways to frame. Again, in my book, 83 Composition Tools, I could group maybe 10 of them, and I should do that, into framing techniques. Because there's a number of ways you can frame. You can frame in an oval. Did you know that? Or circular frame. Like you could be looking through something that's circular. That's a circular frame. There's, you know, there's rectangular frames like a doorway or a window. Those are all very useful tools. And something, don't ever, because it's a basic thing, don't ever forget it. It should be in your toolkit all the time. Okay, next up is um, Bob again. Bob's going to talk about symmetry. I love symmetry. Here's Bob. The symmetry that made the shot. Yeah, you know, I wanted it to be symmetrical. Yeah, it it just came together for me as a symmetrical photograph, and you know very often portraits I shoot symmetrically. This portrait of a guy in Western Cuba smoking a cigar. It had I wanted the cigar because it's Cuba. Mm -hmm. I like the his hat in the background framing the photograph. Yeah, and then I shot it until the smoke was in just the right configuration. It took a lot of frames. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes the smoke went over his face, over his eyes. With this kind of shot, you always have to focus on the eyes because we always have eye contact. Whether it's a painting, a photograph, or in person, we always look at each other's eyes. So if the eyes are soft, it's not going to work. Right. You know, always focus on the eyes. The fact that the tip of the cigar is not sharp is irrelevant. You don't even really notice. But it's a symmetrical photograph. It needed to be symmetrical because mainly because of the hat framing the shot. Mm -hmm. But I use symmetry quite often. So guys there we go this photograph on the cover is an example you have a pretty symmetrical photograph and my wife who happens to be standing offset is breaking the symmetry so that's another really powerful tool because your eye is sort of like drawn to the symmetry and then there's something breaking it which in this case happens to be the subject so it really brought it brings your attention to her um, the other thing that he you know he brings up here is always focus on the eyes that's so important and that's true whether you're photographing a person or an animal we heard that from florian schultz you always make sure your animals that you're focusing their eyes are sharp because listen if their nose is out of focus or their ears are out of focus you, if you have a really shallow depth of field it doesn't matter but if their eyes are sharp you can get away with it but if their eyes are you know fuzzy soft as bob said forget about it why because we connect we always connect through the eyes. So that's a really good point. Okay, we're going to hear from this other dude one last point here that he makes. Let's see what he's talking about. I think it's about geometry. I don't know. I didn't pay too much attention. But let's see so what he says. In a small village in Spain. But the story behind this is seeing those clouds, I, I got this angle from where I was looking up at the clouds, but also getting an interesting sort of geometry um, with these buildings. And by the way, geometry plays a huge part in photography. Here's a geometric set of forms. Your eye just tends to be sort of drawn to it if you can line those geometric shapes up. Thanks for joining me and thank You want to use geometry. Again, Cartier-Bresson loved geometry. He was all about geometry. Bob Holmes uses geometry. 
find it, find it in your images. By the way, that last photograph that uh, there's a little story there, which is also kind of interesting uh, of that village. That was a small village called Santa Pau in uh, northern Spain. And it was at the end of the day, and I hadn't really found anything super remarkable to photograph. It was a beautiful little village, but I was getting into the car to leave. I was traveling with friends. That's always a challenge. Bob mentioned that, you know, you have to be on your own. Here I am, the photographer, and I was getting into the car. I was opening the car door, about to get in. I looked up and I saw those clouds. I went, whoa, wait a minute. Whoa, you guys hang out here for a second. I'm going to go. And I, I, have a, I have teed off my friends more than once because I'm chasing a photograph. And they're like, oh, dude, and here goes Mark again. OK, anyway, so I look up. You know, it was the angle that really caught my eye. And that made that an interesting photograph because it changed the geometry dramatically. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here, you guys. You have a full meal here you can digest. And these are really key points. I don't want to just, you know, bring these up. I want you to use them. I want you to add these to your vocabulary. Think of a, a composition that way. You know, Joe McNally talks about the language of light. You have to understand the language of light, which we'll get into in another show. But there is a vocabulary of composition. And listen, if your vocabulary is, contains five words, you're not going to be able to construct very interesting sentences. After a while, you know, when it starts to be like, wow, cool, yeah, you know, that's not a very interesting conversation. If you've got 83 vocabulary items in this case, there may be thousands of them for all I know, but I I stopped at 83 because I thought that was kind of the number that it just seemed like I had nailed it. And, you know, anything further than that was probably just combining them. And that's another thing that's important about composition. Again, just like in cooking, you can combine different tools and composition together. So you can you can combine framing, for instance, and capturing the moment or framing and, and punctuation. You know, those obviously can go together very nicely or leading lines in framing. You know, they're not always just going to single themselves out and stand out on their own. You, you're presented with whatever you're presented with. OK, so let's take up um, some of these questions. I see this one from Lorraine. I think I struggle with feeling like I have to document as it is and I hesitate to move things. OK, yeah, that depending on what you're doing. Are you a documentary photographer who is obliged to leave everything the way it is okay then that's what you're shooting fine you can't do that you you feel like it would be you know morally a, a a breach because you've done something fine i'm not really talking so much about that uh i'm talking about in in, in that case you really still need to move around and take advantage of what bob was saying you know fill the frame with what you want in it so that certainly can be done and you can crop out things. Like here's an example. If you're taking a picture of somebody and you stand at uh, eye level and there's some kind of building or object behind them that's, that's going to be distracting, well one way you can get around that is you kneel down, you get a low angle, and all of a sudden they become more prominent in the frame than whatever the object is behind them. This is why sports photographers you'll often see them kneeling down on their knee. They're not just doing that to get comfortable. They're doing it to, for a couple of reasons. One, that athlete, instead of being framed against like a building, all of a sudden they're being framed against the sky. Okay, so that opens up. The athlete against the sky is more interesting than a building right behind them. It also makes them look more apparent, more uh, strengthens them. Whenever you take a photograph of somebody and you're looking up, they're going to look bigger, and more dominant in the frame. So those are a couple of different points. But I think uh, to also give another really good example of that, uh, recently we had uh, Doton on yeah. um, talking about a lot of his street photography. And the, a fantastic example was his photo of the weightlifters that he talked about. Oh, yeah. And he wanted to get it set up in a very specific way. So he had to 
bend over a fence yes. in that area. And he couldn't even look through his viewfinder when he took that shot. But he knew and he visualized, you know, going back to that first point, he visualized that shot and he knew exactly which angle he had to do to get it. So even though he couldn't look through his viewfinder, he knew that he could get the right shot. That's right. Yeah, and Jared, absolutely, real estate photo photographs should be clean. I mean, if you're going to sell a house, I mean, this is just, you know, real estate 101. You want it to look good. You, you, one of the things about that, too, is you don't want things that are personal objects that are going to distract the person from what you're selling because they're not there to buy your your knickknacks. <laughs> They're there to buy the house minus the knickknacks because they want to visualize what their own stuff would look like in its place. So clean is definitely the way you want it to be. Okay, one or two more questions. What else, Jared? Are there any others that we have in there? Uh, I don't know that I've seen uh, any questions, but a lot of people commenting and a lot of people really like you know, just to reemphasize what Bob talked about, yeah. um, you know, you're responsible for everything in the frame. It's a really good mantra. And like I said in the chat, um, you know, it applies to all kinds of art and really just about anything that you're doing. That's right. Mark, Mark says it a lot. Like this is a quote that we say uh, probably on a weekly basis, you know, you're responsible for everything in the frame. It's certainly something that we try to use, you know, here at the studio with our work. Yep. Um, and it, you know, it's a very good, it's like, uh, Truman's, you know, the buck stops here. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's just another way of saying that the buck stops with you as a photographer and you're responsible. Yeah. Well, that's so true. Listen, you guys, thanks for joining us. And I'm glad we had a chance to talk about composition. It won't be the last time. I'm not just trying to sell you this book, but uh, listen, I knew when I wrote the book that this was a big area of concern, and I couldn't find anybody else who had written a complete roundup of composition, so I thought, okay, I'm going to do it. And I researched not only all the people I had interviewed, but I started to research classical art, because you'll see a lot of the examples in here are Rembrandt and other classical artists, you know, that had already figured out this stuff long before photography came around, you know, they had, you know, one of the things I realized that there's a kind of a disconnect in some people's minds between art, classical art and photography. And you have to realize that photography grew out of what people already knew as painters, they had already figured this stuff out and they used it in their composition. So I re kind of reconnected those dots and it's really important to have the full view of composition going back to the cave days because the earliest cave drawings are all about telling a story. You know, there was one guy that saw a saber-toothed tiger and he came back and and put it on the wall of the cave so he could tell everybody else what it looked like, you know, why he was frightened out of his mind and he drew those pictures, which is just like us taking our photographs. Okay, guys, listen. Hey, Jared, tomorrow we've got Vincent LaFerre and you mentioned, hey, you know, he's really a, a Renaissance man. And, uh, Jared, t you know, from your view, I know Vincent pretty well, but what was it that struck you the most about what you found out about him? I think what really struck me about him is, man, he has just done, and his website's really good. Uh, I'll put it in a link in the, uh, but let me find that. But Lince, uh, if you look at his, all the different things he's done, you know, he's worked with, uh, Apple and then he's done yeah. like kind of travel photography and he has like some super artistic stuff yeah. and then like really serious like he uh did reporting on um 9-11 he did a lot of post 9-11 reporting yeah um he did katrina photojournalism he's done sports like man it's like is there anything that this guy has not done when i was uh you know he does fine art it's just amazing it the breadth of all the stuff that he's done. I'm going to put his yeah. link here in the description 
right now. Oh, before I forget. Uh, so I highly recommend you check that out. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. While I'm on the, the subject of survey, will you put our survey in there too, our newest one? If you guys haven't taken it, will you please take it? It's really helpful. If you want to participate, if you don't want to participate, don't don't fill out, don't bother with the survey. It's going to ask you, you know, how you'd like to participate. And it's I think it's pretty cool because we're finding areas that people really want to contribute and participation is really important. You know, we're building a community here. This isn't just about a couple of guys, you know, doing a YouTube channel. This is about you. It's about you, wherever you are in the world, being a part of an international movement of photography and creativity and continuously elevating that. That's what AYP means, advancing your photography. Okay, guys, tune in tomorrow, 10 a.m. Please be there with us. And will you please subscribe if you haven't? If you're watching this video and haven't subscribed, do so. Like it, share it, you know, leave your comments. I, I read your comments. I read everybody's comments and I try to reply to every one of them. Okay. And remember, say it along with me, remember to get out and capture your own images of life. And we'll see you guys soon. Love you guys. Take care.